This is section 8.6 and I've broken this into three different videos. So all three have to do with applications of the principle of inclusion exclusion. This first video is going to introduce you to two different types of notation. Uh, not including the one in the textbook, so I will explain why I'm not using the one in the textbook. And then we're going to take a look at what happens when we want to find the number of outcomes when we have no conditions satisfied and how that approach can help us. So let's look at the first new notation. If I'm using conditions, I'm going to let C1 and C2 be two conditions. So going back to our example of the Venn diagram, this would be C1, this would be C2, and this would be where C1 and C2 are both met. So same idea, but we're using C for condition. Now, your textbook instead uses a capital P for properties. So it's up to you. If you want to change all of my C's to P's, that's fine. Um, so again, if I'm looking for A union B, which is this is the principle of inclusion exclusion for two sets that we looked at before. So that number, remember those straight lines just mean the cardinality of the set, now becomes N, N standing for the number of elements. So N C1 would uh, represent what used to be the number of elements in A and n c2 would be the number of conditions met or number of elements satisfying c2 and then of course here's that intersection so really it's the exact same property that we're looking at we're just looking at it um, using c's instead of you know set a set b and so on now what we're going to take a look at in this video and in the next two videos is how we can leverage this situation. So this is saying, I want to find the number of elements that are not satisfied by C1 and not satisfied by C2. So before I talk about how the book shows this differently, what we're talking about is this square represents the universe of all potential elements. Then we talk about these are the elements satisfied by C1, this is by C2, and this is the intersection. So essentially what I'm going to be looking at is finding the total number and then subtracting everything in here. So our previous video focused on finding everything in here. So all we're going to do now is we're going to be looking at subtracting that from the total number of elements. Now, again, going back to the way your textbook shows this, your textbook shows this as P1 prime would be equivalent to my C1. And then both of those are just different ways to show the complement. So it's saying P1 is not met or C1 is not met. So this is what I'm going to use and this is what your textbook uses, and it's really the same thing. So again, N is the universe, all elements, and we're going to use what we found before. This whole segment is going to find the parts inside the Venn diagram, and then we're going to be left with anything that's not met in any of those sets. So really, this is just a recap of what we talked about on the last slide. Um, do note that there is a subtraction sign around the entire bracket. So you can choose to kind of show it whichever way you want. Um, you can subtract each one where one condition is met and then add where two conditions are met and so on. Or the way that we learned the principle of inclusion exclusion before was adding all of the elements where one condition was satisfied, subtracting two, adding three, and so on. Before we change things up again, let's take a look at just a first practice question. So this is no condition satisfied with two conditions. So this says how many positive integers not exceeding 500 are not even or divisible by three? So again, it's the not that tells us that we're going to be computing 
that section that we just talked about. So again, if we were looking at our Venn diagram, we're going to let C1 be the even integers. So C1 is here. And we're going to let C2 be integers divisible by 3. And then we're going to let C1, C2 be that section in between the intersection. And then we're just going to apply this formula to find all of this area out here, which would be anything left over. So here's how this is great. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do exactly what I did before to compute this section, because remember, this is really A union B with our old notation. So this tells me that I'm going to find the number of elements in C1. So C1 is even integers. So we know how to do the ceiling function where we say 500 divided by two would give us, oops, all of the even integers or the number of even integers, which is 250. And then C2 is divisible by three. So 500 divided by three, and that gives us 166, which is how many um, integers are divisible by three. So again, that gives me 250 here and 166 here, but now I need to subtract this section in the middle because it's been counted twice. So how do I know numbers that are both even and divisible by three? Well, those are numbers divisible by six. So I'm going to divide by six and find 83. So again, before what we did is we said, let's take 250 plus 166 and subtract 83. And that's what we're doing again, but instead what we're going to do is say, let's find now the number that's not here which means let's take the total universe. And in this case, the universe is positive integers not exceeding 500. So there are 500 of those because 500 is included. So essentially I'm taking 500 minus all of that and I'm going to get a total of 167. So that means inside of this region, if I were just finding 250, plus 166 minus 83, that would give me 333. But because I want to find out how many are not even or divisible by three, then I'm finding this region out here, which is the whole universe of 500 minus 333 to give me 167. Now, there is another alternate notation, um, and I just find it a little bit cleaner. So again, we're saying not n is exactly what we just talked about. So n, c1, c2, so on and so forth. It gets a little bit cumbersome to write it in that way. Um, again, we could say n minus the summation of all of the elements where one condition is met, plus the number of elements where two conditions are met, minus three conditions, so on and so forth, which is basically what we're doing. But again, summation notation still kind of ugly. So just to simplify it a little bit, we can just say let S0, S sub zero be the number of elements in the universe. So we're going to start with that. We're going to subtract S1. S1 represents where one condition is met, S2 where two conditions are met, S3 where three conditions are met, and so on. So quite often, if we only have the two conditions, we'll stop right here. Obviously, if you have three, you'll subtract S3, you'll add S4, you'll subtract S5, and so on. We're gonna look at one last example using the sieve of Aristophanes. So before I talk about how we're going to look at the principle of inclusion exclusion with it, let's just remind ourselves how we use the sieve of Aristophanes. So what we would do is we would take a look at N, which is the numbers not exceeding a certain value. So N in this case would be 100. And we would say, well, what is the square root of 100 
which is 10. So I want to look for any prime numbers that are less than 10. So that would be 2, and I'm just going to circle them in my little list over here, 3, 5, and 7, because the next prime is 11, and 11 is obviously greater than 10. So really we're just looking at primes less than the square root of n. Now the sieve of Aristophanes, doing it the long way, is basically says start with 2 and circle 2, but then cross off any multiple of 2, because obviously those values are not going to be prime, because they have a factor of 2. And then do the same for 3. So circle 3, but then cross off any multiples of 3. So 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, and so on. And then do the same for 5. So circle 5, cross off 10, 15, 20, and so on. And then do the same for 7. So circle 7, but cross off 14, 21, etc. So anything that you haven't circled, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, these are all prime numbers. Now obviously I only went through 21 because I did, was too lazy basically to draw out all 100 and because I can make my point this way. So the only other thing we have to talk about is 1, because 1 is that special number that's not prime and not composite and so we would take that out of the equation. So, so far from through 21, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 primes. But I want to know all of them through 100. So, and I don't want to have to write out all of the numbers from 1 to 100 and use the sieve of Aristophanes to do it. So we're going to use the principle of inclusion exclusion. We're going to start by finding the number of of integers that do not exceed 100 but just as we did here we have to take one out of the equation so typically we would say s0 is 100 because that's how many numbers don't exceed 100 but it's actually going to be 99 because we have to take the one out of the equation or we'll be one off in our total count then we're going to say what are our conditions because when we use this we have to do conditions so C1 is going to be numbers divisible by 2. C2 is going to be numbers divisible by 3. C3 is numbers that are divisible by 5. And C4, condition 4, is divisible by 7. So now what I need to do is find out all of the ways that one condition can be met. Well, we know how to do this because we just did this um, when we looked at two conditions. So this is just four conditions. So really what I'm doing is looking at the ceiling function of 100 divided by 2 plus 100 divided by 3 plus 100 divided by 5 plus 100 divided by 7. So that gives me 50 plus 33 plus 20 plus 14. So a total of 117. And now we're really just going to keep doing that same process. So I'm going to start here and say now I'm looking at 2. S sub 2 means two conditions are met. So really the hardest thing is making sure we capture all of the ways two conditions can be met. So I'm going to say if 1 and 2 are met, then I'm looking for numbers divisible by 6. And if 1 and 3 are met, so that's 2 times 5 is 10. And 1 and 4 are met, so 2 times 7 is 14. Then I'm going to look at 2 and 3. So that would be 3 times 5 or 15. And then 2 and 4, which is 3 times 7, or 21. And then I'm going to look at 3 and 5, which is 5 times 7, or 35. So again, same idea. 
we're going to find 16 plus 10 plus 7 plus 6 plus 4 plus 2 for a total of 45. So S2 is 45. Now we'll look at S3. S3 is where three conditions are met. So I'm going to take 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3 would be 2 times 3. I'm going to do this over here so I don't forget. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 4, 1, 3, 4, and 2, 3, 4. Those are all the ways that three conditions can be met, so I don't want to screw it up. 1, 2, 3 would be 2 times 3 times 5, so 6 times 5, or 30. Uh, 1, 2, 4 would be 2 times 3 times 7, so 6 times 7 is 42. And then um, 1, 3, 4 would be 2 times 5, which is 10, times 7, which is 70. And then, oops, 2, 3, 4 would be 3 times 5, which is 15, times 7, which is 105. So I'm going to get rid of these. And that gives me... 3 and 2 and 1 and obviously 0 because 100 divided by 105 is not a whole number. So 3 plus 2 plus 1 is 6. And lastly, we're going to look at S4 and 4 conditions met would be oops, 100 divided by 2 times 3 times 5 times 7, which is 210, which is obviously 0. Whoops, switched up colors there just for fun. So now, if I want to find the numbers, the prime numbers that do not exceed 100, then I can take 99 minus 117 plus 45 minus 6 plus 0 to get 21. So there are 21 primes. So again, this would be S0 minus S1 plus S2 minus S3 plus S4. So this is just another way to show your work and to keep yourself organized because it, it can be very difficult to stay organized in a question like this. Up next, we're going to take a look at how we can use what we've just learned with the linear equation model.